What heaven is like? One question that has intrigued uh, people of, uh, of all ages has been, what is heaven like? In this search, however, for what heaven is like at the end, many religions and philosophies have been put forth. And before we talk about what the Bible says concerning heaven, I, I want to review the major concepts of heaven developed throughout history. This is pretty compact here. If we understand the extent of the thinking of the rest of the world on this subject, then we may better appreciate what the Bible offers us as the information about this place called heaven and our experience there. So various concepts of heaven. Now I'm not putting these in the, the, the chronological order that they were originally thought up, but rather in religious and philosophical categories. Be a little easier to handle here. So here we go. Some concepts of heaven held by non-Christians. There is the heaven of the materialist, materialism heaven. Materialism is a philosophy that believes that there is no spiritual life, all is matter. Everything is matter. Everything that exists is simply molecules and atoms. For naturalists, there is no heaven. This life is it. And once it's over, it's over. Heaven is a BMW, a Malibu beach house and $10 million in the bank. That's heaven. Hedonists, a type of materialist, mostly focused on uh, gratification, sexual gratification, or atheists, or evolutionists, or communists, or extreme capitalists, or, or Nazis, all of these are materialists making heaven here on earth. That's one kind of heaven. Then you have what's called existentialists. Existentialists, heaven is what you make it. Heaven is what you make. If you have found happiness in who you are or what you do or even what you believe, then that's heaven for you. The New Agers, you know, philosophy idea that came out several years ago, all the self-improvement and self-empowerment ideas, listen to your own voice, follow your own heart, trust yourself, the human being is at the center of the universe. Self-actualization is the, is the goal. You want heaven? Be the best that you can be. That's heaven for you. Then you have the religions of the Far East, what's called Far Eastern religions. There are several of them. Confucianism, the wisdom of China, an ancient religion, uh, actually not a religion, but a philosophy. Uh, for Confucians, uh, heaven was a well-ordered society. That's what you shot for, a well-ordered society. Shinto, another religion, the royal religion of Japan, heaven was continuous Japanese supremacy. Today, Shinto is more about ancestor worship than anything else. Buddhists, that's another Far Eastern religion. Heaven is peace achieved by a person who completely ceases to be himself. That's heaven for the Buddhist. The Taoists, T-A-O, Taoists, which is the spiritual religion of China. For the Taoists, heaven is harmony with all things. Balance between the yin and the yang. You find the balance between yin and yang, that's it, that's heaven, that's what you're shooting for. And then you have the uh, Eastern religions, you have Far Eastern, then you have what's called Eastern religions, and the main one, there are many, but the main one is Hinduism. Hinduism, for a Hindu, after a reincarnation of many, many lives, one is finally merged into total oblivion with the great spirit Brahma. They say heaven is like 
a you're a drop of water and you finally fall into the sea. That's heaven. And then you have Far Eastern religion, Near Eastern, excuse me, Eastern religion, then Near Eastern religions. Uh, these are, there are several small uh, ones of these, but the main ones, uh, followed by a great number, um, are one of them is Islam. For Islam, heaven or paradise is the best of all earthly pleasure enjoyed indefinitely with Islam ascending. That's heaven. That's why you know, the idea of the 72 virgins you know, that they talked about, those who are martyred uh, while uh, in jihad, while pursuing jihad, their reward, 72 virgins. Well, you know, that, that's an earthly thing. You know, Jesus said in heaven, you know, the, there is no marriage or giving in marriage. We're like the angels, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. So for Islam, heaven is Eden here on earth. Judaism is the other Near Eastern religion. Uh, the concept has changed uh, throughout history and it has evolved, especially for modern Jewish people. Heaven is cultural Israel leading the nations in a renewed heaven and earth. In other words, God repairs and renews the world and puts the Jewish nation as the head or the lead nation in this world. That's heaven. So for these two uh, religions, Heaven basically is returning to the Garden of Eden. That's heaven. And so as we study what Christianity's view of heaven is, uh, you will note that there are some similarities, but the differences are so great and the concept of heaven so elevated in Christianity, these other views of heaven do not even compare. So the doctrine of heaven begins in the Old Testament and then later on well developed by Jesus and the apostles in the New, uh, the New Testament. Now the Jews in the Old Testament had limitations on their understanding of what heaven uh, was like. For example, they had no concept of eternity. They believed that forever meant that something would just go on and on for a long, long time until it stopped. Uh, they had no concept of infinity in mathematics, for example. They did not perceive a time where there would be no time, where forever meant without end, ever. That was not a concept uh, held by uh, the Jews in the Old uh, Testament. Also, they had uh, no direct revelation from God concerning the actual condition of the body after death as is given to us by Jesus and Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15 talks at length about what the body will be like uh, after death. Uh, the Jewish people didn't get that kind of uh, definition, if you wish, that kind of uh, information uh, during uh, their time, their period. And most importantly, they had no one come directly from heaven to assure them that there was life after death for everyone. In other words, nobody among the Jews resurrected from the dead and came back and said, hey guys, let me tell you what it's like. I was there, I'm coming back to, they didn't have that, uh, that, that person. They had, they had individuals that were taken up to heaven even without dying but the person who went to heaven didn't come back and give them information on what it was like. So they didn't have that. The Jews understood that the underworld, where the dead and the souls go, and the earth, uh, where mankind dwelled, and heaven, where God and His law and the angels dwelled, they believed that all of that was just one single unit. Here's a diagram that tries to incorporate all of these Old Testament ideas, you have that on your, your uh, sheets. They understood the world to be a flat saucer, surrounded by water and the sky, the heaven, like an upside down bowl covering it. You know, like you have some leftovers or something, you have it on a plate and then you get a soup bowl or something, you put the bowl on top to kind of cover it and put it in the fridge. They kind of thought that that was you know, the extent of the universe and heaven. 
uh, and the spiritual place where, where, uh, where God was. Heaven was divided into layers, either three layers or seven layers, and it housed the weather, the stars, as well as certain of God's uh, chosen ones. Now, as far as the Jews were concerned, uh, to try to go to heaven was seen as presumptuous. The Tower of Babel, for example, was a presumptuous sin. Imagine, we'll build a tower to the heavens. They were wanting to go to heaven. How presumptuous mankind had become. And one day, God's judgment would cause a catastrophe in the heaven and earth complex. They had no word for universe. So they referred to the sum of creation as the heavens and the earth. The Jews often used the term heaven interchangeably with the name of God. You see that in Daniel, for example, chapter four, verse 23. With time, the Old Testament Jews understood that the righteous ones would go to a dwelling place in heaven. However, the condition of that person the experience of that person and the proof that it was possible was only provided in the New Testament. Of all the prophets, David was given great insight into the resurrection of the soul from death and its ultimate home with God, but he wasn't given very much detail as we see in uh, Psalm 49, for example. He writes, but God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol. So he gets a great insight. He's not going to stay in the underworld. He's, God's going to redeem his soul for he will receive me. Okay, that's good. I'm not going to stay dead forever. That's a great, a great insight, but there's not a lot of information and he doesn't provide a lot of information in other places about the condition of that other life that he uh, hopes to receive. Well, we go into the New Testament, New Testament concept of heaven. <clears throat> the word heaven comes from a Greek word which means to ascend or to lift or to heave. The word refers to what is above. That's why we people say heaven above because the Greek word actually meant above. It is used 272 times in the New Testament, mostly in the Gospel of Matthew, 82 times alone in the Gospel of Matthew, and used most often in the phrase, the kingdom of heaven. The Jews seem to compact heaven and earth and the underworld all in one single unit. I explained that and showed you a little diagram. In the New Testament, it is made clear that there are the heavens which God created, which are part of the physical universe, and then there's heaven, the high place where God dwells, and they are not the same thing. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, 14, the writer tells us that Jesus passed beyond the physical sky, the heavens, to sit at the right hand of God's throne in heaven where God dwells. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Peter says that the physical heavens, the universe, will be destroyed at the coming of Jesus. So when we talk of heaven, we're referring not only to the sky and the clouds or anywhere in this physical universe, it is not a physical place, but rather it's a dimension where pure spirits exist and where God can actually be approached. Some other features of heaven described by the New Testament. First of all, there is only mention of one heaven in the New Testament, except where Paul mentions being caught up into the third heaven, 2 Corinthians 12. It could be that Paul meant he was taken beyond the physical heavens into the very presence of God. We don't have more information from that text. Another thing is that God is not alone in heaven. He is surrounded by a variety of beings. In Revelation 4 verse 4, talk about the 24 elders with crowns in reference to the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. Uh, talks about millions of angels and martyred saints. The Bible also differentiates between the heaven where God dwells and the heaven where God will dwell with the saints through Christ. I repeat that. That's important. 
The Bible, the Bible differentiates between the heaven where God dwells and the heaven where God will dwell with the saints through Christ. Throughout the New Testament, the dimension that is completely inhabited by God and not shared with both God and His creation is called heaven. God is everywhere, man and matter are not. God exists in both the heavenly dimension and the physical universe simultaneously. Man, however, exists only in the physical universe. Jesus is the bridge between the heavenly realm, the heavenly dimension, the heavenly kingdom, and the earthly dimension, uh, uh, or the universe, if you wish. That is what is so spectacular about God becoming man. He leaves the dimension of heaven where only He is and enters into the dimension of man. At the end of the world, God will destroy the heavens and the earth, the physical universe, but not the heaven where He exists with His angels and other spirit beings. We read in uh, 2 Peter 3, I think it's worth noting, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all of these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements, see the heavens and the earth, right? And the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to His promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then we go to the book of Revelation and it tells us that the new heavens and earth, in other words, the new dimension where the saints will dwell, will come from heaven where God exists. So we read in Revelation chapter 21 verses one and two, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Not earthly paradise. There won't be an earthly paradise. There won't be a regeneration of the Garden of Eden. Why? Because it says the first earth and the first, the heavens will pass away and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city. Oh, what, what is that? The new Jerusalem coming down uh, out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. You have to understand in the Bible, you know, uh, the writers use several metaphors to talk about the same thing. The new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the bride of, you know, it's different ways to talk about the same thing. The point that the Bible makes is that God actually creates within His dimension a place for the risen saints to coexist with Him. We read about that in Revelation 21 and 22. This is what Jesus refers to when He said, and I go and prepare a place for you. What place is He preparing for you, for us? He's preparing the place where we will dwell with God. A new place, a place that has never been needed before. This new place called the new heaven and earth because it will now include beings that come from earth transformed or glorified into spiritual beings suitable for existence in heaven with God has several features. And I want to talk about those now. It'll be a place where God will coexist with man in a single dimension without the need of a mediator. Little background information. There are many uh, theories about the end of the world and how Christians are transported to heaven. Some of these are quite complex. Premillennialism, for example, if you ever saw a diagram of premillennialism, it's got arrows and you know, uh, lines and so on, so on and so forth. Very, very complex. Uh, and this idea of heaven, if you wish, and when it will take place is espoused by 
evangelicals and Pentecostals, uh, and the idea was first invented and promoted by a man called John Darby in 1830. And it was popularized through uh, what was called the Schofield Reference Bible. And more recently by preachers and writers uh, like Tim LaHaye, the man who wrote the Left Behind series. Uh, uh, megachurch preachers like John MacArthur and uh, Jerry Falwell and David uh, Jeremiah, uh, all espouse this theory. Uh, their preaching is filled with it. Personally, I don't trust these men to teach me about the complexities of heavenly things when they can't even accurately teach the simple truth of the gospel of salvation, each ignoring and denying the need to be baptized for the remission of sins. I mean, if you don't get that, how are you going to explain to me what heaven is like? A teaching so clear, so basic, that it is taught in every single gospel and referred to at least 10 times in the book of Acts alone. Like the process of salvation, which, is, uh, which simply requires faith in Jesus Christ expressed in repentance and baptism, and I read the scripture that we all know, Peter said to them, who was the them? Well, the crowd on Pentecost that, that asked Peter, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We've crucified our own Messiah. What are we going to do now? And Peter re replies, he could have said anything, but what did he say through the power of the Holy Spirit? Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The process of going to heaven is relatively straightforward an idea as well. My point here is the process of salvation is a relatively straightforward idea. Believe in Jesus, express that faith in repentance and baptism, and remain faithful. It's not a complicated idea. In the same way, uh, 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 the idea of the end of the world is not a complicated, is not a complicated uh, thing. Christians live faithful lives until they die. Matthew 24 verse 13. In death they sleep or wait until Jesus returns. Well how do we know this? A couple of uh, scriptures. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14, Paul says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Well, who are the ones who have no hope? Well, the ones who don't believe in Christ. They have no hope. Who are the ones who are asleep? Well, they're the ones who are Christians who died in Christ. Why? Because they accepted Him as the Savior and repented of their sins and were baptized to demonstrate their faith. And then he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which we do, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And then in Hebrews 9, 27, the writer says, and inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, whoops, Hinduism says you die over and over. For <laughs> inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Uh, you die, you sleep, the judgment, Jesus comes. Another passage, this time I go to the Old Testament. Little background here. Saul, King Saul, by now, this part of 1 Samuel, as you're studying with Marty on Sunday, uh, has pretty much lost his mind. He certainly has lost his faith, and he's in uh, trouble facing uh, an army that will destroy him. And he, he wants to get information from Samuel, who was his advisor throughout his life, but Samuel has died. So what does he do? He goes to see the witch of Endor, or a witch in Endor, and uh, uh, a spiritist, if you wish, to try to call up you know, a message from the dead, which was, of course, forbidden, but he does it anyways. And God uh, uh, uses the witch you know, to uh, to uh, bring up uh, Samuel, to make Samuel appear. So that, that's, the, that's the background. But watch what, what Samuel says. Then, so Samuel says to Saul, 
you know, he's been called up, actually God has called him up, not the witch, uh, and he says, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? <laughs> I mean, I, I laugh when I see that. He goes to all this trouble to get advice from Samuel and Samuel chews him out. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Disturbed him from what? From sleep. I was asleep. I was at peace. I was simply waiting for the Lord and you've called me back into this mess. And then he says, and Saul answered, I'm greatly, dis you know, Saul, true to character, not I'm sorry, I, I apologize, no, 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 no. And Saul answered, I'm greatly distressed for the Philistines are waging a war against me and God has departed from me and no longer answers me either through the prophets or by dreams. Therefore I have called you that you may make known to me what I should do. And he regretted that because Samuel told him, you're going to die, and, you know, it's, it's over for you. And then uh, I go back to the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, we read there, it says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, three things mean the same thing. He's going to get the attention of the whole world. And then what will happen? The dead in Christ will rise. Who are they? Well, the ones who are asleep. Then we who are alive and remain, the ones who are alive when Jesus comes, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall be always with the Lord. It doesn't say, well, we're going to be with him for about seven years, and then there's going to be a big war, and then after that for a thousand years, then this is going to happen, and that is, no, I didn't say that. Man said that in 1830. Because in 1650, they didn't promote this idea. A point we need to note here is that what Paul compares, uh, excuse me, what Paul compresses into just a few verses here for the Thessalonians is explained at great length elsewhere by Peter and especially by John. Basically, however, when Jesus returns, remember, he said, like a thief in the night, like a thief in the night, you don't know he's there and then he's there. People who spend their lives, who spend millions of dollars on TV shows and all kinds of things uh, uh, in order to explain the complexities of how we will know when Jesus comes and that it's actually really close and it's going to be now or next Thursday, you know? And yet, the Bible says, like a thief in the night, you're not going to know. What, what, what is it that we don't understand about you're not going to know? So at Jesus' return, several things are going to happen and are explained in symbolic language, but it will all happen at once. So at Jesus' return, the saints will rise and they will be glorified to join Jesus and the living saints in heaven. The heavens and the earth will be destroyed. Satan will be punished and bound forever. Sinners and disbelievers will be judged and punished. The dead Christians will awaken from their sleep and along with Christians who are alive when Jesus returns, they together will put on glorified bodies and join the Godhead at the right side of God with Christ as head of the glorious church. Because if you're sitting at the right hand of God with Christ, you are in the Godhead. And all of these things will happen in the twinkling of an eye. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, not some long drawn out period of years or millenniums, as those who interpret the symbolic language of revelation in literal ways, what they seem to think and promote, 
As I've said before, this, this place in the air, the new heaven and earth, will be a dimension where we will coexist with God. This place will have new features. There will be no experience of pain or sorrow or death because there will no longer be the curse of sin. No elder will stand up with blue cards in heaven. They won't have to, they won't have to. The evil spirits as well as evil people will not be there, but will exist in places of punishment prepared for them where they cannot cross over to us, nor we to them. It will be beautiful to perceive. Those who exist there with God will also be different in many ways, according to the scripture. Their form will not be flesh, but pure spirit like angels, and therefore no need for sustenance of any kind. They will not be subject to death, so there will be no need for any form of reproduction. The population will be stable. They will not be tempted in any way because there will be no sin, no fear, no shame, no guilt, and no death. Why? Because the devil will not have access. He will be in the lake of fire forever. People there will have complete and equal wisdom, complete and equal strength and knowledge. What does that mean? Well, it means that there will be no competition, that there will be no envy, that there will be no war. Why? Because nobody will want what you have and you will not want what anyone else has because you have everything you need in abundance. Another thing, people there will not be subject to the pressure of time because they will be eternal. Have you ever thought what it means to be, we always think, oh, eternal, forever, it'll never end, but the practical uh, impact of no time, if there's no time, that means there's no worry. If there's no time, that means there's no stress. There's no impatience because all of those things are caused because I, I got time, I don't, I don't have time. I know you need me, but I, I don't have time. Oh, I'm going to be late. I'm not going to get done everything I need to get done by Friday because it's got to be done by Friday. In heaven, there is no Friday. It's always today. At that place, the people will have complete joy, complete love, complete peace, complete patience, complete faith, complete self-control and kindness and self-worth. In other words, no more hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I'm going to be happy with who I am in heaven. And I'm going to be satisfied with who you are in heaven. And in that place, the people will be conscious of self and others and God, but all in perfect harmony and satisfaction. I will know my wife, Lise, and I will be happy for the new existence that she has and that I have, that we share together, but separately. I'll be happy with that and so will she. So therefore, there'll be no sorrow. There'll be no longing for the past because there will be no remembrance of the past. And that's a promise given to us by Isaiah in Isaiah 65 verse 17. No remembrance of the past. What about, what about my great, great, great grandma? I'm going to be thinking about her. No. No. No remembrance of the past. How could, how could we spend a single millisecond thinking of the past when we are in the presence of God? <laughs> I mean, that takes up everything 
that we have. And now the most asked question about this topic is, what are we going to do in heaven? Are we going to play the harp? Are we going to be in church service forever? That'll be okay if I'm the one preaching, but other than that. <laughs> the New Testament gives little information, but it does mention a few of the things that the saints will experience in heaven. For example, the saints will have an intimate relationship with God and deepen their knowledge of Him. What does Jesus say in John 17:3? 17, 17, he says, and this is eternal life. Okay, okay, what is it? He says, and this is eternal life, that you shall know God and His Son, Jesus Christ. What? And this is eternal life, that you shall know God and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the essence of the life that we have been, promising, uh, been promised. Experiencing the joy that comes from interacting with the perfect, all-knowing, all-loving God forever. You know what that's like? I mean, the only thing I can think, I mean, that maybe comes a little close to that, is like falling in love. Do you remember when you fell in love? Do you remember those times, you know, the first times that you loved you know, your beloved? No matter what's happened after, but just remember that time when you fell in love? You couldn't get enough of each other, right? Every new thing you found out, oh, well, you just wanted to know everything about them, everything they explained to you, everything they told you about them. You were hungry to know them. You'd be on the phone. It was one in the morning. You had to get up to go to work the next day and say, well, good night. No, no, you say good night. No, you say good night. No, you say good night. I love you. Well, I love you too. Well, you say good night. No, no, you say good night. You know? In my mind, being in the presence of God is like falling in love forever. That moment, that feeling, that desire, that warmth, that door opening with all the possibilities that you hope for as a person. In that place, we will judge the nations, it says, and angels, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. How this will take place, we don't know. Perhaps their witness will be a witness against wicked men and spirits, meaning the witness of those who are with God. But there's a hint of it. Another thing that's mentioned, we will serve and reign with God, 2 Timothy 2 verse 12, and also in Revelation 22 verse 5. Some ask, well, what will the saints reign over? I mean, you know, the world will, will have been destroyed. My thought is that they will reign over the spiritual dimension and every other dimension that's been created by God or will be created by God. Do we think that God has only revealed our universe to us? What makes us think that He has exhausted His creative power with this creation? Are we saying God can't do more if He wants? The Bible says that we will reign with God over what He reigns over. It doesn't describe what He reigns over. This will be part of the wonder and joy of being in heaven. Our service and action in heaven will be tied to our reign with God over His creation, whatever that will be. One thing for sure, if God creates it, it'll be marvelous. My personal opinion is that the spiritual realm is more beautiful and complex than the material realm. And so I look forward to that aspect of life after this life. And then the saints will continually praise God. In Revelation 14, two, it says, and I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. This is where people get the idea, you know, that the saints are be playing harps in heaven. 
But the passage says that the saved and the sound of praise was like water, was like the sound of many harps. To be in the presence of God will naturally provoke the saints to praise. There can be no other reaction. The people on earth who came face to face with a theophany, an appearance of God, or perhaps an angel, just an angel, would fall on their faces. Why? Because they were sinful. But in heaven, we'll be in glorified bodies with no sin. We can stand before God without falling down and fear and praise Him to our hearts, uh, to our hearts content. Now there may be other things that the saints will do in heaven, but as far as I know, these are the things that God has chosen to reveal to us in this, in this world and in His word. And so the question comes, what heaven are, are you striving for? Are you striving for the heaven of material wealth and comfort? or the heaven of self-realization, or the heaven of sleep, you know, where you simply disappear and cease to be. This is the heaven that suicide victims want to go to, or people who are suffering, they want to go to that heaven, because you will go to the heaven that you are striving to go to, that's for sure. The Bible tells us, however, that there are only two real places to go after we die. One is hell, where we consciously suffer the loss of hope and happiness. And one is heaven, where Jesus Christ is, and we consciously will experience our transformation into a new spiritual being free from suffering or death. A place where we will experience the presence of others who know and love God in Christ just as we do. A place where we will experience the joy of a relationship with God that includes serving Him in a variety of ways and knowing and appreciating, uh, appreciating Him without end, all without frustration, all without boredom, all without failure. Do you want to go to heaven? I mean the real heaven the only heaven that exists, because the others don't exist, or they only exist for a little while. The only way to go to heaven is to enter in through the way to heaven, which is Jesus Christ, who returned from heaven after his resurrection. If you want to live forever with him in heaven, you have to die with him in repentance and baptism here on earth. It's, it's that simple. Jesus is calling you to heaven this evening. And if you wish to answer his call, I say again, repent, be baptized if you have not done so already. And don't delay in being restored if you have wandered away from Jesus through sin or through neglect. I encourage you tonight if it is your night, I encourage you, be prepared to go to heaven as we stand and as we sing the song that has been selected for our song of encouragement. Shall we do that now, please? <laughs> 